Okay, I think we're ready to begin. So I'm uh, Kurt Caswell, I teach in the Honors College, and uh, usually Diane Warner, who is one of the organizers of this conference, the primary organizer, is here um, <coughs> to facilitate, and she couldn't be here, so I, it has fallen to me. But uh, I'm not just a pretty face, right? I have a mind and a heart, too. Um, <laughs> So I'm instructed to tell you, uh, please turn off your cell phones, that the, the event uh, is being recorded by video and audio. So if you could make sure your cell phones are off, that would be fantastic. Um, and then over here on the table, there is a, a form to fill out uh, if you want to uh, give to the endowment that will support the Sawa collection uh, and the library here. You can also find that form, I think, online at the Special Collections, Southwest Collections, Special Collections Library website. All right, so the president uh, got tied up, so we have Dean Michael San Francisco from the Honors College who will give a few opening remarks and then we'll get on to the first panel. Thank you, Kurt, and thanks all for coming. This is such a beautiful day and it's a great day to have you here for this conference. Um, as you well know, this, the Sauer Collection is a, is a vital part of our institutional literature collection and uh, the, the entire works are, are really a reflection of our respect and caring for the environment in its, its most uh, transient ways, right, as we well know. And I think uh, one of the things we are doing first and foremost that I'm supposed to be doing is to give you on behalf of the president, a warm welcome and his sincere apologies because he got double booked and he has uh, another meeting now that he couldn't get out of. So he, he really, really values this, has done this and supported this in many ways. One of the things that's connected to the president's office and honors college through the works of uh, Kurt Caswell and Barry Lopez uh, is um, we have actually set out on a new search for a senior faculty person in honors to work with the collection and uh, uh, people with the collection here, Diane Warner and Jennifer. And so that's really, really important. And uh, it's a combined effort of the president's office and the honors college. So that's really, really good. The uh, absence of Barry Lopez is, is uh, very sad. He cannot be here. Uh, due to his health, but he sends his best regards. He's with us in spirit, and hopefully he'll get a video of this uh, well, conference, you know, sooner than later. And uh, but he he is here with us. So just keep him in your thoughts. Thank you. All right. So the first panel, um, the the two panelists will introduce each other. Uh, but it's a creative writing panel uh, in fiction and poetry, I believe. All right, so the panelists may take us from here. I am going to introduce our other panelist here. Um, so this is Clara Bush Vidala. Um, she's a newly licensed veterinarian who is receiving her DVM in two weeks from Texas A&M University's Veterinary School. She received her undergrad degree in EVHM with the Texas Tech Honors College in 2014. She's the author of one book of poetry, Prairie Smoke, Poems from the Grasslands, published last year. She writes poems about animals, nature, and veterinary medicine, and is excited to be back in town for the Sowell Conference again this year. Thank you. <laughs> All righty, so I'm gonna read some new poems um, with sort of this theme of what, what it means to be wild and what it means to be animal and how those two things are different. Um, so I have this kind of idea that there's something sort of unifyingly wild about being an animal, uh, but also something that's uniquely separate between what we 
normally considered domestic animals versus actual like wild animals um, in nature. So, or non-domesticated animals. Um, so these poems are kind of my attempt to flesh out those ideas um, and show some of the similarities and differences between those two things. So um, some of them are poems about my own pets. I have two dogs, two cats, and a cockatiel, um, and their names are in some of these poems here. And then some of the other poems are about some of my patients as a um, vet student this year in the zoo medicine ward, so some of the wild animals. This first poem is called Lulu Turns to Leaves in the Sun. There is an old energy that tangles fur into dirty patterns, leaves hair on every surface, curves tired legs the shape of sleep, the shape of keeping warm. The same feel blends leaves into muddy feet, a deep breathing, a steamed breath, the crunch walk of broken twigs, the careful step of burrs and dogs' paws, the old dogs, know it best. The creaking of their knobbled bones, muscle, the cold creeping snapping sounds into their joints while they spin and dirt, dust flinging and play despite ache, age. My old dog sighs, laying in the sun beside me. She melts, deep brown red into the leaves around her. She looks up into the sky, squints, sniffs her nose toward what she fiercely believes in, me, poem. And this one is about, I don't know if any of you know what an axolotl is, but it's a funky little amphibian that uh, never goes through complete metamorphosis, so it stays in its larval stage its whole life, um, and it looks like a Pokemon if you've ever seen them. They're like super weird, but um, <laughs> this next poem is about axolotls, so it's called Axolotl. If only I could be as young, as fragile, as amphibian, gill-frilled mane, pink like cheeks flushed and cold or whimsy, as larval as this ageless sleuth, metamorphosis at bay, geriatric just a figment, a tail flat and like a rudder, dorsal fin of fake fish. If only I could move with some direction, listen to the tingling in my spine, if only I could stay as close to amnion as pale and gape mouth less than lizards do in water. Their lives in it, gelatin bodies nourished and bloated by it, short feet and claws widened as if always grasping the whole of the world, or as much as they can feel tickling the nerves of neonatal fingertips, knowing nothing less than discovery, newness, inspiration throughout each translucent organ in every generation. If only I could be as thin-skinned as salamander and still as calm, cool, as fluid, still afloat. They have their skittish moments too, cannibal even, because lost limbs grow back, slow swim creatures taste best, get caught, tail snipped, three-footed, still swimming, bigger bellies swell like globes pregnant with their own self-same meat, warm with it, asking to be alone with it, lonely after all. This next poem is a, a little bit silly. Um, it's about my cat whose name is Sonnet, um, and she's kind of a jerk, so I decided to write a poem about loving my cat, even though she's a jerk. Um, Sonnet, How I Love My Cat. I'd love to write a poem about how much I love my cat, but she's made of less of love, abundant, more of rage, of such unfettered Valkyrie, of wrath. She's hiss and creature, soft and fierce, Athena, beast. I wish her talons stopped before my skin. I wish my hair could stand on end to feel out fear like hers. She likes to bite my shins at night, and after showering, she'll lunge aloof and chew her feelings into toes always licking first before the bite, tongue, a rough address, to warn, as though she knows her foot may soon be flung toward her face, the lick she might believe, her saving grace. She's a weirdo. <laughs> <laughs> Legless. The only thing telling legless lizards who to be is that they have two lungs heaving either side of their chest and snakes who would be worse to be, have only one lump of air-filled tissue slithering down the insides of their lonely backs, 
emptier body, cavity having only one chance to cough or suck or wheeze before fits of apnea shiver from a disarticulated jaw down a thin spine, out a short, thick tail, and back again around a sick coil slinking under leaves to die. The only thing legless lizards keep is second chances, numb like earthworms before the rain, phantoms tingling vestigial things, primordial skitters and shakes, things lost, pinging beacons to bodies worthless, slow, fickle wiggling through a world meant for limbs, even if only a lone, long arm. This poem is about a mouse that I used to have. It's called Mouse. I could have cut him open. It wasn't fat curving him into a cold noon on the floor of his home underneath a plastic hut. I've operated on rats after all, and it's mostly the same scooping lumps out of anything with cancer. You hope and you hope and you hope. That's all, really. I should have watched him grow. I should have seen him growing. His tank, I took a long time to clean it after he died, should never have hinted of ammonia like it did. Bland colored cardboard flakes of bedding keeping uneaten pellets hidden. I should have put him under a scalpel. I should have cut a little hole for his teeth in an anesthesia mask. I should have fitted it to his nose and peeled his pelt off, picked the tissue out. I should have taken him to a real vet. I should have killed him first with euthanasia. It was only the one afternoon he laid cold and alone and didn't move, at least. Rodents aren't known for being clean or hardy. That's what I should have been. He was slow, all tumor by the end. His death was harder than I thought. This next poem is for all of the turtle and tortoise patients I've seen. Um, it's called Kilonian, which is basically like a collective name for anything that's a turtle, tortoise, or terrapin. So um, this is for for those guys. For every slow whisper, there is a turtle, slower, quieter yet, a shell softer, deeper, and smoother than any dark secret voice. For every slick floor, there's an algal slime stuck slicker to the back of a diving slider, a wet eye slipperier than any crooked gaze your way. For each creeping foot, a clawed, Jurassic limb end, sneaking easier and murk, tire texture, shuffling assured across asphalt. For every sewage leak, a depth of refuse swims steeper by an arrow-headed sludge puppy, eyes open, a winter spent under even this sluck too. And if you watch, every water surface plinks more pyramids than Egypt, more armor than a battleground, more old bone than graveyards, my God, even the broken shells showing marrow still flock swim with all the other ancients toward the deep middle of slow living. Kilonian for every season, turtle, tortoise, terrapin. Kilonian every fused spine to shell, every cracked, fish hooked, wire foot amputee, every mold over dog's trash, every ant heavy amphitheater, every prehistoric snip of every finger too close to every leathered, learned beak. This next poem is for uh, one of my other dogs who we got as a puppy. Um, his name is Zeus, this is about how we named him. We had no trouble naming the dog. He found himself a million names. He was so small at eight weeks we added baby to the front of everything. Then Zeus fell out of the air. Came from an old belief in the size of feet, from old paws we knew to have grown into themselves. We should have listened at three months to the teeth, maybe, instead. We called the puppy a dog's name for so long it must have stunted his growth. He became anything but what we had named him. We imagined he'd stopped growing when it came to be he had canines in his mouth on either side, six months at least, less than 30 pounds still. We thought we'd done wrong, but he grew into stories. A friend of all creatures, less maniac spark unrelenting, more the deity my brother favored, a miniature of my parents' dog. He smuggles innocence out of even kittens and holds it away, keeps their small toys in his mouth, and tears all the bigger things he can find. He cherishes the diminished, lives his name with taut muscles tingling electricity, and keeps other names too, 
too vain to stop from looking our way each time we call him something new. Um, this next poem is about one of my favorite experiences I've had as a vet student, which was uh, when we had an owl patient who hooted at me while I was feeding her, and I just have like this fascination with owls, they're my favorite animal, so it was one of the best days of my life, it was super cool. Um, so I had to write something about it, obviously. But This is called Barred Owl, Broken Wing. The only hoot I've ever heard, the earless owls in person, burned my ears iron hot with the weightlessness I imagined she must feel, waiting for her plucked feathers to grow back. The echo of her throat call chimes in her, like aluminum flecks of reflection might beam her off of a lake into the ink beyond the web branches of old pines or Texas pecans. Relic assassin, I am still, in terror of the long nail scraping my wrist as I present to her, she's learned, her meal. She seems to mumble only when I offer barehanded the waterlogged thaw mouse to her bone lips. Click, 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 click. I know the noises mean she's only a shield, weapons sheathed in her own fear, but my palms sweat closer to her, the limp meat dangling just shy of her mouth. She tilts her head, composes her skin, smalls herself, perches. I want to lean in deep, pool into the silt-colored stare, give her all of my meat, but happen a glance at her shifting feet. She raises up, unhiding her long thighs. I peel backward, drop the mouse to hear it. To hear it, I small myself, take a breath, part my lips, offer all I have for a meal over again. Um, and this next poem is all, and about another favorite patient of mine who um, was a chicken who was hit by a car and had a broken leg. Um, and she was like the most badass chicken of all time. Um, <laughs> And I, th I think sometimes people forget about chickens being birds. They just think of them sort of as their own chicken entity. Um, so this is about an experience I had when we were caring for this chicken in the hospital. It's called Chicken Hawk. The ER took in a wounded Coopers looking decidedly more fragile, slunk over in his cardboard box and the chicken who'd been hit by a car the same morning and fitted with an orthopedic implant to keep her leg straight, just as straight as she needs it to walk. She clucks about the tile floor during evening treatments, gulps her chicken meal down a red tube in her gullet, flirts her buff ruby feathering at every prospective adopter, flaunting her homelessness as reckless abandon, as hardy, rough and tumble, as useful in a free range setting she assumes she will acquire. She is freedom soaking in the ten color of her cage with each penning of her pupil so she might remember what a caged one of her felt like. So she can be unafraid even of predators when she is finally left to a field. Who cares what car slid sideways her way? She was out in it then. The grass scrubs her trophy and treasure. For the risk of greener grass, goats and hay, low wood fences without the wire named for her, she crossed the road that day and never blinked. If she were to look up, she might see talons hovering in the field or rain slithering into turkeys' necks, but she shuffles forward always, never pray. She lives on faith. The hawk is dull and listless on its perch, a donut of old towels around his keel to keep him upright. He longs for sky, but you could never guess he thinks about anything but dying here. He assumes his tomb and fights you for it flailing weak wings and snapping his jaw for a piece of you, when what he needs is to eat the thawed mouse at the end of your tongs, to grip your thick gloves with his feet while you hold him upright, to show you that he can still see, is not blind, is not destined to starve when he leaves. He was a bird, after all, a real and powerful one, lost his flight. The ER tech forgets immediately of the chicken's birdness and sets the coopers beside her, a chicken hawk, his more formidable name. They sit overnight like that, the chicken unbothered, leaving soon, she thinks. The hawk keeps on living, wishing he could have died where no one might have seen him do it. In the wild, what a scene it might have been. The downed hawk wanting to eat her, the mangled chicken limping on. 
Um, and this last poem is um, more of kind of a tribute to all of my colleagues in veterinary medicine who have had a rough go of things. Um, there are some statistics out now that say that veterinarians have one of the highest rates of suicide of any profession. Um, so it's something that we talk about a lot when we're in school um, and we put a lot of effort into making sure we have good mental health and things like that. But I think part of the reason, um, among other things, that this is such a problem is that um, I think a lot of people who get into this profession are drawn to it because they have a love of animals. And when you get into the actual work of things, you're seeing animals who are afraid to be around you because you're the one that pokes them or they're at their most dangerous or their most vulnerable. Um, so to me, that's sort of a different kind of wild animal because we're, we're mostly seeing domestic animals, but they've sort of reverted back to these kind of instincts. Um, and I think that's, that's part of why we have a hard time adjusting, I guess, after we get out into that field. Um, so this is called Every Veterinarian's Elegy. But first, do no harm, is to imagine yourself as pain, as every blood feather blooming from bone picked clean off and every ugly bird left, as every placentome unfolding its broad ligament of being from every cotyledonary uterus Every litter-spotted womb still working for some reason its keeper can never explain. Every inch-together wound after every tumor removal that never gives you long enough for the itching skin to heal before metastasis sets in. Every tartared and weathered canine loosing its ligamentous grip, and every whisper would leave a weird mouth, but a painless one to pull. Every dead tooth halitosis you still want to kiss from. As every hiss of air from a cat's slack flail chest, every pneumothorax and cracked rib, every anesthetic death that no one ever pays for, except that you remember it each time you induce for years. Even as every worm invading artery after artery after teaching over and over the importance of keeping parasites benign, of using drugs to so easily prevent cable fatalities, miserable failings of organs and vessels, lost breath, as every quarantined creature terrified whose bite you could predict but not prevent, who needs medicine at its own expense, even as it pleads to be left alone, you are its advocate until someone determines its end, and then reaper. How do you treat what is afraid to be touched? How do you save a life that is not its own, whose someone else's property to be leased at the cost of whatever you charge, how do you keep a heart pumping well enough to make euthanasia easy? Did you know it's the sickest who die slowest? That we know that because we've seen unsick stuck with barbiturates too. This is to imagine knowing every condition and injury every non-human thing can suffer. Every anxiety of leaving animals out or behind as your own self-reflection. What if you miss disease in your own family? To imagine even the rare and wild things need you to if they fall out of habits that keep them healthy? How do you keep out living every furred and feathered, scaled amphibian, aquatic thing you wanted to keep? You might see every last one of your patients die. After they have all gone, who remains to be saved? What is left but the empty loop at the end of a leash? Thank you. me a little emotional when I read it. Um, I had a pet mouse who, it, it's really common for them to get cancer and so they don't live very long anyway and I didn't think he would be like all that important to me but um, I came home one day and he had like all these lumps over him and then within a few hours he was just gone and so I didn't like have a chance to do anything about it or to help him and 
like for me being in vet school and knowing that I probably could have done something to ease his pain a little bit maybe um, that was really sort of sad to me (laughs) I was more sad about it than I thought I would be for just a little mouse but yeah Claire um, I loved your poetry and I was just wondering uh, I know that y'all had said that you had already published one book Um, is it on Amazon? It is actually. Um, it's called uh, Prairie Smoke: Poems from the Grassland, so you can you can find it there. And I have I think I might have some with me too, so I'll come find you later. <laughs> I, I have another class. So. Oh okay. Sorry. That's okay. Do you think about other writers? Um, so I've read a few books by other veterinarians who write sort of about their experience and from what I can tell all of that writing is very personal and very much about sort of how animals shape the person um, which I think is kind of weird because these people are like science minded people they're not necessarily the creatives of the world but all of the the themes and those works that I've read have been similar and I think it's kind of um, it must be a reason that people get into veterinary medicine to feel closer to animals in some way so and I think that's certainly true for me but um, I don't know many other works by veterinarians but just from the few I've read that's kind of the sense I get. My question is for um, for Claire and then Meg. Um, Supposing I had students that uh, wanted to get into to writing poetry, um, talk, talk about the process, maybe the planning process, and, and, and really the, um, the the dynamics that you did to plan up to these pieces. Um, personally, I write a lot about my experiences and. Um, especially in veterinary medicine, I think sometimes I just hear a word that sounds cool and I'm like, oh, I should write something about that. Um, so that's kind of how things start. And then um, then I try to, to work towards some kind of collection of things, I think, because I come to this conference and that's sort of the goal of how many things I need to write to get to a certain point or what, I, what theme I should write on or things like that. So I try to have some kind of end goal in mind when I start writing something. Um, It doesn't always work out that way and sometimes things go in like completely different direction but uh, yeah I just I write about what's around me and what I see and that's kind of where I start even if it doesn't start as a poem just observational or journaling or things like that. So um, growing growing up I had a few pet chickens. It's a bit silly but they do have very distinct personalities, almost like cats in some ways. I love chickens. <laughs> so what, what was it about this particular chicken you wrote about that that was striking that got your attention? Um, so she just was so resilient and she had somebody had found her like on the side of the road because she was hit by a car. So she came to us and miraculously, she was run over by a car and the only injury she had was one broken leg. So we were like, oh, we can fix this. Um, so we gave her an implant and like watched her heal. And when we'd get her out, she'd just like walk around the clinic floor and like hang out with us and was not afraid of anything. Um, but especially when they, they put that hawk next to her in the hospital, which is um, a Cooper's hawk, which is also known as a chicken hawk. Um, So she's literally the prey for that species. And uh, we came in the next morning and saw that they had just been like sitting there together and we were like, oh no, her healing is gonna tank. She's gonna get so stressed out and not get better. And then she was like totally fine and hadn't even noticed there was a hawk sitting next to her. So um, yeah, she was just my, my favorite chicken. She was awesome. And then she got adopted out somewhere after her leg healed, but she was kind of like our resident pet chicken for a couple of weeks while you're there. Actually, you reminded me, Evan. So, uh, last summer, my wife's workmate 
uh, us because we would take out their birds, and we oftentimes take out people's birds. Well, it turns out that these birds were two chickens, <laughs> and they were pet chickens. And they came into the old cage and all that, and in the evenings we were supposed to let them out, right? So walk in the backyard. And our dog was also out in the backyard, right? And he's about, you know, a little terrier fellow. And he was watching them, and they looked just like dinosaurs. If you look at a chicken's legs closely, you'll see your past, right? You'll see the past of the earth. And it's amazing, and they're so incredibly funny but also dangerous. Some of them, the dog didn't know what to do, but they were about the same size. It was a great exercise. Just watching me. What I like about that poem, Chicken Chicken Hawk, is the way that they both kind of used to similar spaces. You can make the questions around the all of us and all the spaces and poetry. So thank you to the panelists.